All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's Richard M. Karp Distinguished Lecture. I'm Sandy Arani, the Associate Director of the Simons Institute. So the Institute is, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, is the leading international venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science. We were started with a generous grant from the Simons Foundation in 2012. Um, and we established this Richard M. Karp Distinguished Lecture Series to celebrate the role of founding director Dick Karp in theoretical computer science, formulating its central problems and an amazing array of results. Um, and it features uh, talks by visionary leaders in the field um, and it's geared towards a broad scientific audience. And we're really grateful to the many people who have contributed to make this, fun, this distinguished lecture series possible. And today I'm really happy to uh, welcome our speaker, Monica Henziger. I met Monica when she was a graduate student in Princeton and I was spending my part of my postdoc here there. Um, that was just a few years ago, five, <laughs> five or 10 years ago. Um, she was already a rising star in the field of dynamic graph algorithms and has been a pioneer in that area ever since. And since that time, um, she's spent almost a decade as a director of research at Google. And then she's had professorships at EFPL in Switzerland the University of Vienna, and now the Institute of Science and Technology in Austria. She's very well decorated for her many contributions to the field, member of the Austrian Academy of Science. She's received two prestigious advanced grants from the European Research Council. And in 2021, she was awarded the Wittgenstein Prize, the highest scientific award in Austria. So I'm really excited to welcome Monica today. And she's gonna tell us about dynamic graph algorithms, what we know and what we don't know. So. this great introduction and thank you for not telling any embarrassing stories about me as grad student. <laughs> I was worried there for a second. <laughs> okay, so you see I work at this beautiful place. You see a picture here of IST Austria and of course you should all come and visit or apply for a postdoc position. It's wonderful there. Okay, so but today I will actually tell you about dynamic graph algorithms. Now it turns out while they are theoretically interesting, and that's what you heard last in last week's CARP lecture, um, they're also practical and useful for real life. Uh, so in the real life, they're all the time large changing graphs. For example, you look at street networks, right? There are traffic jams coming and going, and you always want to know the shortest path. Um, there are social networks that continue to grow. That's what this little... Ah, what, wrong pointer. This little thing here is supposed to show they continue to grow, so nodes keep on being added, and you might want to know clusters in the graph. Um, same thing with the World Wide Web. You might want to analyze that. Many physical systems are actually modeled as networks, dynamically changing networks. There was also a study conducted in 2020 uh, uh, amongst computer scientists that work in the field, in the industry, and also more than half of them worked on large dynamically changing graphs. Okay, so in this talk, I will first give you a very brief introduction to what are dynamic graph algorithms, in case you don't know. Then I'll show you the state of the art, and then I'll talk a little bit about what's going on right now for lower bounds, and i also show you one upper bound technique. And finally, uh, I'll talk about the experimental evaluation for dynamic graph algorithms, because I think that's also important, and mentioning future work all through the talk and also at, at the end. Okay, so assume you have some computational problem and the static setting is a usual one. You have some input, you stick it in the algorithm, you get some output and you're interested in the running time and if you can solve the problem exactly in the approximation ratio. Now, however, assume you did this once. So you had some input, you stuck in the algorithm, got some output and now the input slightly changes. Now, there's a traffic jam here happening right now. Okay, so some small change and now you want to get a new output. And you'd like to get this new output faster than recomputing from scratch. You'd like to take advantage of the fact that you solved already for the similar output, for the similar input. And then you might get another small change and so on and so forth. So the question that we are studying is, can we, if there are just small changes to the input, 
can we compute the output faster than recomputing every time from scratch? And if you have formulated this way, it's really a data structures problem. Okay, so whenever we talk about dynamic algorithms or dynamic graph algorithms, it's completely wrong. We should always talk about dynamic data structures and dynamic graph data structures. However, the field calls it dynamic graph algorithms, and so we live with this name. But in reality, it's a data structure what we want. Okay, we want to store a graph, and then we want to provide operations to modify the graph, to update it, or to ask queries, okay, to access the data. Okay. And so really what we want is we want to have some initialization and then we want to have queries and we want to have some more updates and we have queries and so on and so forth. And if we always put this into the data structure and get some output and the question is how fast can we do the updates and the queries. And so in this talk specifically I talk about dynamic graph algorithms and so what you get as input is a graph and you have one operation that's initialization you only execute it once, and its running time is called the pre-processing time. And then you have a sequence of updates. So you might insert edges or delete edges, and you could also insert or delete nodes. Um, often we don't study this because we assume that there is an infinite set, or as many as you need, isolated nodes sitting around anyway. And so you can always model inserting a node or deleting a node by just taking an isolated node and adding edges or removing edges of an existing node. Okay, and these are the updates, and then you can ask queries. Queries might have no parameter, or one, or two, or whatever you want. Okay, now note that there are also other dynamic models that I'm not talking about in this talk, but I want to also acknowledge them, and they also have interesting work. So there's the insertions-only setting called the incremental setting, the deletions-only setting, decremental setting. So I'm going to talk about fully dynamic, the fully dynamic setting where you can do insertions and deletions. But there are also these two settings and there's tons of works also in this area, mostly because there are problems for which we know or we think we know uh, that you cannot solve them efficiently in the fully dynamic setting. And then we're still trying to get efficient algorithms at least in the incremental or decremental setting. There is however also the subgraph model. Um, where you're given an initial graph and then an update can just turn on or off individual nodes. And when you ask a query, it's always a query in the graph induced by the nodes that are currently turned on. That's a very good model. The other one is the F uh, sensitivity model or also called emergency model, um, where you're given also an initial graph and then you do a batch update of size F, which means you're doing F update operations all at once. And then you ask a query in this modified graph. And then you go back to the original graph. Okay, and now you can do the next batch. And the question is always how quickly can you do a batch? And this is also called the emergency setting because it was motivated by, by this uh, 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 setting that assume you have a city and there are all these bridges around it. And then you say, what if these bridges go down? Can I still get my population out? Or what if these bridges are down? How quickly can I get my populations out? Okay, that's where the motivation came from, but also an interesting model. A little bit further away are these kinetic data structures. So they're more geometric. So here the nodes are points in space and you're given a trajectory for every node. And you might be interested in which nodes are close to which other nodes. And the update operation is changing the trajectory. Um, then there are data streams. You're probably familiar with that. Um, here you have always a sequence of updates and usually you just ask one question at the end. That's one query that should say not update. And here you care mostly about the space, not so much about the running time, but the space is the most important thing. And finally, more recently, temporal graphs have become popular. Um, not sure who <laughs> invented them, but I know of some early work by Kempe and Tardos in that field. And in the last five to 10 years, people have more and more started to work on them. So here the idea is uh, that you are given a graph and every edge has labels that indicate when the edge exists. So think of a time dimension. So every edge has a label that says it exists from this time to that time. And then again, from this time to that time. And now traversing an edge takes you one time step. And now you wanna, might wanna ask, can I get from A to B? Or how quickly can I get from A to B? And if you travel from A to B, 
and you add some node V, you can actually also wait at this node until an edge becomes available to leave the node again. So these are temporal graphs and they study different <coughs> questions than we do. Okay. So back to dynamic graph algorithms. I already talked about the real world ap applications. Last week in uh, Aaron's talk, you heard about the fact that they can be used very successfully as subroutines in static graph algorithms. And I just wanted to convince you that it's just also a very fundamental computational question that we are asking. How quickly can information be updated after small changes? So these are the motivations for studying these questions. Now what's known? Well, a work on this started in roughly in the 90s or even the 80s. And so not surprisingly, there's lots known already. The performance measures that are used are usually the pre-processing time. What we want usually is either linear or small polynomial pre-processing time. And then we look at the time per operation. And as you heard in Dr. Paul's excellent uh, uh, talks during the, or you might have heard, uh, during the boot camp, there are different kinds of models how the input is generated. We call them adversary, the process that generates the input. So there are different kinds of inputs or adversaries. There are adaptive adversaries, oblivious adversaries, or also offline dynamic adversaries. The offline dynamic, so in the adaptive, you have an adversary that knows the output of everything so far before deciding on the new update operation or the new query operation. In the oblivious setting, the adversary first has to generate all the operations and fix them, and then the algorithm starts running. The algorithm doesn't know the operations, but the adversary has to write them down. So the adversary cannot adapt the operations towards the output of previous operations. Okay, they are fixed, so the adversary is oblivious to the output of other operations. And in the offline dynamic model, uh, the adversary is even weaker. So the adversary produces a sequence of operations, and then they are given to the algorithm, and the algorithm can look at them. And only after seeing all of them does the algorithm have to produce the outputs in order. And so here you're taking basically the online component completely out of it. And the question is just how hard is it to get the sequence of answers? And it's mostly interesting for lower bounds because we can show many lower bounds hold also in an offline dynamic model. There's a usual thing in data structures, amortized versus worst case running time. I will not get much into that in this talk. And then there's usually a trade-off between query and update time because you might not do anything during an update except for writing down what happened and then do all the work at query time. Or alternatively, you could do all the work at update time answer all possible queries, pre-compute the answers, and then at query time, you only have to look up the answer. What we want usually is that queries are answered in polylog time, because the idea is you want to get answers quickly, and then under these constraints, you want to have the updates as fast as possible. Now, this might not always be possible, because maybe the output is larger than polylogarithmic. Assume you want to actually output the shortest path, and it happens to be a very long path. In that case, what we do is either we say, OK, you should be output sensitive, meaning the running time should be proportional to the size of the output. Or we only return the value of the solution, which might be a little bit of a cheat. We just give you the value of the shortest path and not the shortest path itself. Or we just give you the change in the solution. Yeah. For example, for minimum spanning tree, that works very well. We don't always give you the minimum spanning tree. We just tell you how much, which edges have left the minimum spanning trees and which edges have gone into the minimum spanning trees three after one update. Okay, so the hope is that there are not many changes to the solution, and thus this can be done quickly. Okay, and then of course we look at the approximation ratio, just as in the static setting. Okay, now hold your seat. I will now show you lists of what's known without going much into uh, details, and then I'll go into some more details. So the notation is that I use is a usual one. N is the number of nodes. M is the number of edges in the graph. And polylogarithmic always means polylogarithmic in N. And I use the O tilde notation to mean that I'm hiding polylog factors. No O hats here. OK, so here is the outline of the talk. I'll give you now the state of the art in dynamic graph algorithms, so you're prepared for long lists. Okay, <laughs> so because this has been a field that has been worked on for quite a while, we know a lot. Uh, so uh, in, 
with regard to upper bounds, but still there are some annoying holes. Okay, so for undirected graph, when I use epsilon here, I mean always any small epsilon larger than zero. So for undirected graphs, there's a lower bound of log n, and there is an upper bound of also poly log n. I think it's now log n times, anyway, small, small poly log. Um, Valerie and I gave the first randomized algorithm for this. Holm, De Lichtenberg, and Thorup uh, gave the first deterministic time algorithm for this. In general, I make the results here in bold whenever they work against an adaptive adversary, because that's the strongest adversary. Um, minimum spanning tree, same situation. Uh, edge connectivity, same lower bound. And there has been some recent progress in the upper bound. Uh, single source shortest path, exact. This is lower bound and this upper bound. So they're just some small factors apart. So basically closed. But for all pair shortest paths, interesting things happen already. There's this very old and classic algorithm by Dimitrescu Italiano, uh, which is basically n squared. But the lower bound is just basically linear in the number of edges. So for sparse graphs, there is still a gap. ST max flow um, basically <coughs> closed. Maximum cardinality matching has, again, an interesting uh, gap, namely lower bound of basically square root m, upper bound of m. This is for exact. If you do approximate, you have also an upper bound of. In, in bipartite or, or? In general graphs. General, general graphs, yeah. Bipartite, nothing better known, yeah. Um, if you have one minus epsilon approximate matching, uh, maximum cardinality matching, you have a square root m. Um, another interesting gap is, of course, here with edge connectivity. The only lower bound ha we have is this log n, and these are the upper bounds. So there's another interesting gap here. OK, directed graphs. Um, Reachability, basically tight, strongly connected component. Um, we only have this lower bound of square root m and then the trivial upper bound of m. There has been some interesting work here if you allow higher query time, okay? But I don't want to go into that. Um, transitive closure, again, interesting gap. And there's this work if you allow higher query time. And then all pair shortest path, again, the same gap as in the undirected case. So you see, we know a lot of things, but there are some still classical problems where we still have gaps. Now, if you allow for approximation, you get even more work. Okay, so hold your breath. Uh, this first result, you will hear about a talk uh, uh, next week. Okay, uh, you will get this in the workshop. This will be presented. And tons of other work. Um, um, tons of other work. I will actually talk a little bit today about this upper bound because I think it's elegant and also I think there's some more work that one should be doing. Um, and next week, also this one here. Uh, Cheyenne will talk about this one here in the workshop. In general, I actually wrote a survey um, together uh, with Katrin Hanauer and Christian Schulz on uh, both theoretical as well as experimental work on dynamic graph algorithms. You can find it on the archive and also here in the journal. Now let me go to lower bounds. And now I'm going to get a bit more technical. So in lower bounds, uh, I have to just quickly review the OMV conjecture because my work is going to build on top of this. Um, the OMV conjecture is as follows. Um, assume you're given a Boolean n by n matrix, and you also have a sequence of n n-dimensional vectors, Boolean vectors arriving. And now what you want to do is always to a Boolean multiplication of this vector with a matrix. Okay, and the trick is that you have to output the answer of the first vector multiplied with the matrix before you get the second vector. Okay, so you have to always, as soon as you get a vector, you have to output the answer, Boolean multiplication. And the conjecture is uh, that there is no algorithm with total time um, O of n to the 3 minus epsilon for any epsilon larger than zero for these n vectors arriving. Now it turns out, uh, based on this lower bound, there were now tons of lower bounds for all kinds of problems. And also before, the lower bounds that I showed you that were not log n, they were actually always uh, conditional lower bounds, either conditional on the OMV conjecture or conditional on other conjectures. Okay. While the lower bound that was log n, that was actually cell probe. Okay, so we'll get to this. What about unconditional lower bounds? Well, the only unconditional lower bounds are in the cell prop model. That's an excellent model. 
And um, yeah, the best we knew until very, very recently is this lower bound of log n by Patrasco and Domain. It works for dynamic connectivity, two edge connectivity, planarity testing, things like that. But now I can tell you about the first super logarithmic bound, which was actually achieved by uh, Green Larson. Uh, you can't read it here, and you. I uh, have it on my last slide. It just was put on archive in April 23. Um, and what it shows is that for insertions, only reachability in acyclic graphs. If the worst case update time is po polylogarithmic, then the expected query time must be log n to the three halves divided by log log n. Okay? So you cannot have uh, that both are better than log n to the three halves. So this is very exciting because there was only some very unnatural graph problem for which we had a super logarithmic lower bound. Uh, now we have a super logarithmic lower bound for this uh, reachability problem. However, if you look at it uh, in the conditional lower bounds for fully dynamic reachability, we have a m to the one minus epsilon lower bound. So, sorry? Yes, this is in the cell probe model, this here, this new work, yeah. But this here, conditional, of course not, yeah. So, um, so the conclusion is that, um, oh, sorry, too far. The conclusion is that um, there's still many problems or things that we do not know about, right? So if you are happy with our conjecture, then you think all these problems are solved. But if you insist on having a cell probe lower bound, then we are still far from solving these problems because the best lower bounds are still just polylogarithmic. No, however, you might also ask something else. You might ask, are these worst case sequences overly pessimistic, right? Um, all these things here, are, all these lower bounds are built on this supposedly conjectured one worst case sequence. Isn't this overly pessimistic? And so what I recently looked at with Lincoln and Zaha is we looked at the so-called uh, average case model. The average case model is built on the notion of edge flips. Instead of doing insertions or deletions, we think of edge flips. An edge flip is as follows. If you give me uv, if the edge exists, then delete it. If it does not exist, then insert it. So basically, it's like flipping the bit for this edge, whether it exists or not. And now we propose a very weak adversary, uh, which we call average case adversary. Uh, this adversary can only control whether the next operation is a flip, so an update, or a query. But it cannot control which edge gets flipped. Okay, if the adversary says update, then a random edge will be flipped. Okay. And this is, of course, motivated by the erdos renyi graphs. And indeed, if you start out with an erdos renyi graph and you only do this kind of update operations, you will always have an erdos renyi graph. So these are going to be dense, mostly. Um, it depends on <laughs> yeah, yeah. what your initial graph was. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. But the adversary cannot control the density because the adversary can only say update and not say insert or something like yeah. this, can only say update, yeah? Mm -hmm. So now the question is which problems are hard and which are easy in this model, okay? And so um, what we found out is we were looking at counting model problems in dynamic graphs, and it turned out there's a bunch of problems that are easy, meaning we can do expect a constant time in the average case model, even so in our Worst case models are the standard OMB model. I would call that worst case. Don't think you're worst case versus amortized. I just say worst case when I mean the standard OMB model. So even so in the standard OMB model, we actually had an almost linear lower bound. These problems are counting the number of triangles that go through a fixed node S. Or if you give me a fixed S and T, counting the number of paths of length three, or counting the number of paths of length four, we're counting the number of cycles of length four that go through a fixed node S. This one we can do in amortized constant time, expected. However, we were also able to show that there are some problems that are equally hard. So that have a lower bound, almost linear lower bound in both models. And this was more surprising for us. Um, so it's, for example, counting the number of triangles uh, they go through a random queried node. So the adversary can just say query, and then a random node gets picked, and then the algorithm needs to return the number of triangles that go through this chosen node. Or counting, so fix some S and T 
counting the number of paths of length five. And this seems very surprising because actually counting the number of paths of length four, we can do still in expected constant time. But counting the number of paths of length five, we have this lower bound. Also counting the number of four cycles. Um, now this upper bound here are usually achieved um, as follows. Uh, we keep two types of data structures. There is one type of data structure that needs to be very fast. And every time when the adversary says query or update, this data structure might have to be updated. But then there's also some other data structures that can be slow. And the idea is that uh, it will happen infrequently that these data structures need to be updated. So for example, if you think of counting the number of S triangles, um, if you insert an edge that's not incident to S, you will only run the fast data structure. And that has to run in constant time. But if you insert an edge incident to S, which will only happen with probability 1 over N, then you can run a slow data structure. Okay, so the trick is always um, these problems are chosen in such a way that there are some updates that will happen, that are unlikely to happen, and thus we can have a slow data structure for them. And for the others, uh, you need to be fast for the other updates. I just want a clarification on the model. Uh -huh. the, the initial graph is... Is worst case or or is what? what um, the what? initial uh, graph is a Erdős Rényi graph. Oh, it can be an Erdős Rényi graph. Okay. Yes, with some probability of per edge. I see. Yes, yes. I mean, if you changed it to be a worst case graph, but required it, a lot. This would still work here. This would still work if you allow me linear preprocessing. Yeah. Time. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, I need to do preprocessing yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Are these hours still fast? And like, it's the worst case model, but you're forced to like, you force every vertex does not belong to many mesh updates. Not to belong to many. Like, for each vertex, um, not that only a constant number of its edges. Ah, so the question is: Is this model still hard if for every node uh, it can only have a constant number of incident edges to be updated? Um, we did not look at that more, that variant, and um, maybe, maybe I would have to go through the proofs and see whether they still go through, whether we use somewhere the fact that every edge can exist. Yeah, good question. I don't know. Any other questions? Okay, so now let me just briefly uh, uh, ask the question, what is the status of non-counting problem? I'm only talking about non-counting problems. Well, the only other paper I'm aware of is some paper by here Friedrich and Hebbinghaus, which shows that this all pairs shortest, dynamic all pairs shortest path data structure, which takes n squared time by Dimitrescu Italiano, that in this model here would only take n to the 4 over 3, and under certain conditions even better. Other than this, there are no algorithms known, no fast algorithms known in this model. Okay, now let me tell you a little bit about this lower bounds because that's more surprising, right? That there are these lower bounds and how we do this lower bounds. So the basic idea is we start out again with the worst case OMV conjecture. And we first show, remember in OMV, it's always Boolean multiplications. And first we show how to change this into parity operations. So still, uh, it's a Boolean matrix, 0 and 1. But the operations you do is basically sum modulo 2. So we do parity OMV hardness. And once we have a hardness of parity OMV, we show hardness, average case hardness. So hardness in this average case model of parity OMV. And the idea is as follows. Um, assume you're given the M and the V1 to Vn from the parity OMV hardness proof. Now what you do is you pick a random matrix R and pick random vectors V1 to Vn. And now instead of solving M times V1 and so on, you're solving these four problems. So when, for each I, what you do is you solve the random matrix X over with M, and then you do a, a parity multiplication with VI X over with RI. Okay, that's one of them. 
and then the others are this here. Here is just with ri, it's just r with vi, xi, ri, and r with ri. So all of these things here look like random matrices and random vectors because we XOR them with random ones. They're highly correlated, but each one individually looks random. And of course, they're chosen in such a way that if you XOR the answer of the four, you get the correct answer. Okay? So this was done before in the static <coughs> setting, and we're doing it now in the dynamic setting. Basically, we're hiding a worst case instance um, in four random ones. Now, this sounds nice and easy, but actually making it work on graphs is a pain. And the paper is rather long <laughs> because we have to deal with all these details. So one detail is, for example, that in the standard OMB reduction, a vector is usually represented by order n many edges in the graph, while the matrix is represented by n squared edges. Uh, sorry, theta n edges while M is represented by theta n squared edges in the graph, the graph that you do to reduce OMV to some graph problem. And now, um, now the adversary is allowed to just say flip. So we need to, you have one vector and you now need to create the second vector, okay? So you assume you had just changed the graph to represent the first vector we won, and now the second vector arrives, and now you need to change the graph to represent the second vector. In order to flip one bit in this uh, of the uh, vector v, let's say v2, you had v1, now v2, to flip one bit, which means you need to flip the corresponding edge in the graph. Well, if there are just n edges, theta n edges representing the vertex, but altogether they are representing this one vector. So there's one edge or a constant number of edges representing a certain bit. And now, out of n squared edges, you need to hit exactly this one here. The probability that you hit the right one will be way too small, right? Um, for if you say you want to hit all, there are these n edges, you need to update them. What's the probability that a random flip will actually update one of these edges? There are n good edges, and altogether there are n plus n squared edges. So the, prob the probability is just roughly one over n. And so this is a problem. Because if you need to uh, flip all the random uh, all the bits in an edge, it will not all the bits in a vector. It will now cost you n squared many operations to flip all bits. To flip one bit, uh, the probability is just one over n. So you expect to have to do n flips to flip one edge correspondingly, and you need to flip all n edges in a vector. So it would cost you n squared many random flips. And in this reduction, if you do n squared work to a model to simulate one multiplication, you're dead. You get no lower bound anymore. So this would be too many operations. So what we do instead is we're representing each uh, vector by theta n squared many edges. Now, however, um, while doing flips for edges to represent uh, vectors, you might accidentally also flip bits that are in the matrix. Right? So bits in the matrix can also be flipped. And now you don't have the matrix anymore that you wanted. Yeah. You have some additional randomness in there that you didn't want. So in order to deal with this, we need to do a similar trick as before. We need to actually create three randomly looking problems. And then the XOR of them will always XOR out the, uh, the accidentally created random flips. Okay. There are more technicalities in there, but I will not bore you with them. Just <laughs> telling you, it's actually a pain to make this simple idea work to get this lower bound through. But now what's the implication? So first of all, we get a finer classification of the hard problems in the standard model. Okay, what used to be hard, some of them are easy in the average case. So maybe there the standard model was too pessimistic. And the others are still hard in the average case. So, and as soon as you're hard in the average case on random sequences, it means that it's hard on many input sequences. But this last thing also has a further implication. Um, so think of algorithms with pr predictions. If a problem is hard for random input instances, there cannot be any useful prediction, right? because you cannot predict the random sequence. So the idea is that since random sequences cannot be predicted, if a problem is hard in the average case, uh, it will also imply hardness for algorithms with predictions for this problem. And this gave us then the idea 
to work on algorithms with predictions uh, more generally, to work on lower bounds for algorithms with predictions. And this is very recent work uh, with Saha, Seibold, and Ye. And uh, Saha and Ye will be here next week for the workshop. Um, and the model is as follows. Um, during the pre-processing step, the algorithm is given the prediction sequence. So it's sort of like the offline dynamic model where the algorithm is given the whole sequence of updates and requests. Now we're back, we are away from the average case model, okay? We're back to the worst case model and the algorithm is given the sequence of updates initially, except it might be a bit wrong. You have, this is just the predicted update sequence and it might be a bit wrong. And now there are different ways of saying what does it mean to be a bit wrong. We looked at three different ones. One is delta accurate predictions. That comes mostly from the static algorithms with prediction model, but they also look at, look at delta correct predictions. Also comes from machine learning where you can say, you know, with a certain probability, what you predict will be correct. Um, so here in each step, each operation is predicted correctly with some probability delta. Um, in the L list accurate prediction, for each time step, you give them a set of L many operations and you say it will be one of them and the correct one needs to be in there. And in the delta bounded delay predictions, um, the sequence of the predicted sequence of operations is completely correct, except that the timing might be a bit off. Each operation might be up to D off from the correct time. Okay, so it's a bit too late, or a bit too early. And now here what we can show is actually um, if the OMV reductions fulfill certain conditions, which all our graph reductions do, um, then you can show a strong lower bound. So then no close to linear time prediction algorithm exists for delta accurate predictions if delta is less than one, or for two list accurate uh, predictions, or for omega n bounded delay predictions. So if things can be up to n positions wrong. Okay, so we can show that these predictions will not help. The problems are just as hard as before. And so the corollary that we have is all dynamic graph algorithms with OMV-based lower bounds cannot have close to linear algorithms of these types. This is not really formal, but you know, in our paper, we have all this list of problems for which this goes through. Okay, this also makes sense. There were two recent papers that actually studied upper bounds. Um, one of them uh, by Van der Brandt, Forster, uh, some more authors, um, worked on all pair shortest path and um, they looked on let algorithms with bounded delay predictions. And indeed, they again just dealt with the insertions only and the deletions only model and not the fully dynamic. They had improved results for them. And this now explains why, because basically the lower bounds go through. But, sorry, the lower bound is yeah. uh, with bounded delay is only the delay is like big enough. Yes, if it's big enough. Yes. That's huge, right? That's like the, or O of n is, is not the length of the No, sequence. the length of the sequence is n squared. Okay. Yeah, the number of update operations you would have is n squared. Yeah. Good point. Um, so to summarize the lower bounds, um, cell form lower bounds are the gold standards, but so far we only have polylogarithmic lower bounds. Um, conditional lower bounds, there we have many. Uh, polynomial lower bounds, and some hold even in the average case model. And for algorithms with predictions, for these three prediction models that we looked at, uh, you get many of the lower bounds carry over. Okay, so now let me go to upper bounds. Specifically, I wanna tell you about one specific algorithm, uh, namely dynamic probabilistic tree embeddings. Um, that I worked on with uh, Goranzi and Forster. And I'm telling you that because first of all, I think it's kind of cute, but second of all, I also think it deserves more work. So I want to bring it to the attention of this very smart audience. And uh, yeah, maybe some of you uh, managed to get some improvements. Okay, so here's the topic. It's about tree-based graph approximations. So the general observation is many algorithms are easier on trees than on general graphs. And thus, the goal is if you're given some algorithmic problem and some graph G, you want to represent G by a tree in such a way that 
all the original nodes are also nodes in the tree, but there can be additional nodes in the tree. Um, the edges of the tree can have weights, and the solution of the property of the problem on T can be quickly converted into a good solution of P on the graph. So it tells you something about your graph. And this is called an embedding of G into T. Okay, so for example, if this was the uh, graph, um, this could be the corresponding tree. So all the nodes in the graph would be here, for example, leaves in the tree, and it could be this is one that gets mapped here, and this is two gets mapped here, for example. And then there are the blue nodes here, are additional artificial nodes. Now, um, there are tree-based graph approximations already for all kinds of problems. So for example, if you just want to know connectivity, then a spanning forest would be a tree-based graph approximation. Yeah? It has the same nodes as the original one, and it has exactly the same connectivity properties. If you go to expected pairwise distances for each node pair, I'll cut the others, yeah? But if you go to expected pairwise distances for each node pair, then what you need or what you use is a probabilistic tree embedding, and I will explain what this is in the next few slides. So we will assume always that a graph G is connected, and then the distance of U and V and G uh, is the length of the shortest path. And now the stretch of uh, G and T and U, V will be the length of U and V and T divided by the length of U and V in G, the distance of them in G. Uh, the embeddings will always be so that the distance will not go down. So if U and V have a certain distance in G, the, in the embedded graph T, in the tree T, their distance will either be the same or higher. Okay. And then you say the stretch of an embedding, so stretch GT, is the maximum stretch of any node pair. Okay. Now look at a cycle as example. Uh, assume this is your graph. And now if you delete one edge E, then you get the tree T sub E. Now, what do you notice? Well, no matter which edge you delete, there will always be a node pair that used to have stretch one, and now it has stretch n minus one. Okay? So deterministically, there's nothing you can do. And this was even proven formally. Okay? And thus, Bartal had this clever idea of looking at a distribution over trees. So if gamma is a set of all trees T sub E, if you choose a random tree, uniformly at random, out of this set gamma, and now you look at the stretch, the expected stretch, what you get, it's as follows. For every edge x, y in the graph, the expected edge is, the expected stretch over this distribution is as follows. With probability 1 over n, you actually pick this edge. And then now you have stretch n minus 1. But with probability 1 minus 1 over n, you did not pick the edge. And then you just have stretch 1. So all together, you have stretch at most 2, which is 2 times the distance in the graph, because the graph was 1. The distance in the graph was 1. And by induction, you can show that this holds for every node pair. So actually, the stretch is at most 2. Okay? The expected stretch is at most 2. Okay. And so now we define an alpha stretch probabilistic tree embedding to be the following. Uh, given a graph G and an alpha larger or equal than 1, a distribution over a set gamma of weighted trees, so you have to come up with a set gamma of weighted trees, is an alpha stretch probabilistic tree embedding if for each tree uh, the nodes in the original graph are a subset of the nodes in T, and for each pair UV, its distance in the tree is only larger than the distance in the graph. And the expected stretch over all trees T with this distribution is at most alpha. And now what we just showed in the previous slide, it's actually a little lemma that Karp showed in 89. And since this is a Karp lecture, I thought I have to cite his work. <laughs> so in 89, he showed that there exists a two-stretch probabilistic tree embedding for the end cycle. OK, now there was more work, sequence of work, uh, which ended in this great uh, work, which showed that there, for every graph, uh, there exists an order log n stretch probabilistic tree embedding. And this bound is tight. You cannot hope to get better. 
Uh, now notice that an alpha stretch probabilistic tree embedding returns a random sample tree. It does not give you the whole set of trees and the distribution over it. Okay, that would take too much time. What it does is it gives you, so an alpha stretch probabilistic tree embedding algorithm just returns you a tree that's sampled according to this distribution. It's, it will be important now in the dynamic setting. Okay, so it's basically a randomized algorithm that returns a tree such that the expected stretch is at most alpha. Okay, and so Blaylock, you and Sun showed that there exists an order log n stretch probabilistic tree embedding algorithm with running time m log n. Okay, fast. Okay, basically there. We will use it. Okay, now you can ask, okay, can I do this dynamically? Can I have a dynamic alpha stretch probabilistic tree embedding algorithm? This is what I want to tell you about. There was also uh, some related work that they showed average stretch. Average stretch is not a probabilistic tree embedding, it's a bit weaker because you don't get a uh, uh, result for every pair of nodes, just in the average. Okay, oh, I'm missing something. Yeah, nice picture. So a dynamic probabilistic tree embedding algorithm is as follows. So you have, as before, you have your sequence of graphs. They always change by inserting or deleting one edge. And this algorithm always outputs a sequence of trees, such that for each i, the expected stretch is at most alpha. And we show two results. And so here, actually, the algorithm will not even explicitly give you the tree. It will construct the tree internally. And if you want to have it, it will give you the tree. It will give you the edges of the tree. But actually giving you the tree will take your time linear in the size of the tree. OK, and I will talk here about the first result. And this is the first non-trivial dynamic probabilistic tree embedding algorithm. But you know, as you can see, you would like to do a little bit better. Like it would be nice to have smaller stretch. So statically, you can have stretch that's just log n. And here we are log n to the four. And um, running time is square root m. OK, we get it down to n to the little of one. But then the stretch goes up to n to the little of one. So how do you access the tree? You get like neighbors of, of nodes, I guess, as request. Well, you could do that. You could say, give me the neighbors. Or you can say, give me the tree. Then the algorithm internally has a tree and can give you the whole tree. But then it takes time linear in the size of the tree. Other than this, you can say yes. So for example, uh, here is a node. Give me all its incident edges in the tree. Because the graph, the data structure has a representation of the tree inside. So it can produce that. It's just that outputting it, um, you know, if the graph is sparse, you only have square root m update time. So or say, let me say it differently. This is the update time, and the query time is linear. If you want the output, if you want to get the tree, it takes a linear time because I have to give you the tree. But if you yeah, want, yeah, it's yeah. Just that since oh, it's linear in n and not m. Yes, yeah. outputting the tree is linear in n exactly, and not in m. And you can also ask questions like, here is a node. Give me all the edges that are in incident to this node in the tree. In time, linear in the number. Yes. What does it look like? If if you only have insertions, well, say you only want deletions, then we actually have a better result. <laughs> if we only have insertions, Grammos, did we have a better sorry, result? No, I mean, I mean yeah? sorry, like, if, given... Um, oh, you want to only have the changes in the exactly, tree. Yeah. If you just want the delta, yeah, then it depends a little bit, because we infrequently we will recompute our data structure, as you will see in a second. And when we recompute, then the tree can completely change. While otherwise, uh, in between, there will be smaller changes. Yeah. yeah. So it depends on it, whether you get lucky or not, basically, how large the changes are. OK. So yes? About the, uh, definition on the dynamic algorithm. So the expectation, is it over on what is the on of t here? Um, this expectation over which it is, it's just a randomization of the algorithm, right? Just like I said before, this is a randomized algorithm which to returns a tree that in expectation has stretched at most alpha. So you get the t the no, this is the this is the current t. So it should actually be t sub i down here. Okay. And maybe that's what you're pointing out. Yes, it should be t sub i. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the algorithm consists out of two parts. 
The first part is a deletions only uh, probabilistic tree embedding algorithm, and then we make it fully dynamic. And the deletions only algorithm, um, here we can do log cubed stretch, so that's better. And we have near linear running time m to the one plus little o of one, so that's not uh, too bad. Um, and it also it gives you a tree back that has leaves, that has depths at most log n, and where the nodes of the graph are exactly the leaves in the tree. You guaranteed this by this deletions only algorithm, and we will need this when we make it fully dynamic. And this algorithm basically follows Bartol's approach, but makes it decremental. Okay, so that requires new data structures and some work. Um, but the basic idea is to use this uh, ball growing process and build suitable data structures to make it to make it work. So I will not go into this. And if you want to improve the algorithm, I think you could use this as a black box and try to make the insertions part fast. That would be a good first step. But you can, of course, also go into this. So let me skip that. Now, how do we make it fully dynamic? So here I'm using a technique uh, that Sacha Paul had in his talk, where he talked about batch updates. And basically, this will be some kind of batch update techniques. Um, so what we do is we maintain two data structures at each point in time. We have a deletions only probabilistic T embedding algorithm, the one from the theorem. And we keep a set I of edges that were inserted since the last rebuild. And then every square root M updates, we will rebuild the deletions only probabilistic tree embedding data structure to reflect the current graph. Okay, so you have the insertions in it because it's missing the insertions since the last, since the last rebuild. Okay, good. And so now assume an edge is inserted or deleted. Um, what do you do? Um, if the edge was deleted, you update the deletions data structure. If it was inserted, you update the set I, add it to I. And then in order to build the new tree, um, what you do is um, you look at the current tree in the prob deletions only probabilistic tree embedding, let's say this one here. And now uh, let I be the endpoints of the inserted edges. So these are the edges in I that are missing in the graph, right? So they are missing also in this probabilistic tree embedding tree. Okay, so you're adding them to the tree. We're thinking of adding them in a tree. First, you're just drawing this nice picture. So this is the tree the deletions on a tree, and now we're thinking of, of these edges. And now what we do is we build the following graph P. What we do is for every endpoint of an inserted edge, we take the full path to the root. Remember, it's only depth log n. So in this way, you only add order log n, many nodes per inserted edge. Okay? And so the size of this thing here will be the size of i times log n. So this is the graph that we really built. And then we compute a probabilistic tree embedding of this thing. And in order to do this, we run the static algorithm, this fast static algorithm that I told you before. This only has size square root m because i times log n because i only has size square root m. So I can do this very quickly. So I get this thing here. And now notice that there were some parts of this original thing, original tree TD, that I did not keep here. So I will just glue them back into this. So I take this one here and all the pieces here that were missing, when I built this thing, all the pieces that were missing, I just glue them back at their corresponding node. So this was a child of R, so I made them here a child of R. Okay, and this is my new tree. And we can show that this is a log n to the four stretch uh, uh, tree, yes? Does this translate to any kind of bound on the worst case? Time for number, like if you have all this going on, can you? Time or stretch? Uh, time. Um, yes, uh, no, 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 we are amortized. I know. Yeah, are amortized. One could probably do work and do this rebuilding in the background. If you have yes. things in the background, you might be able to see it. Yes, 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 we might be able to. So the question is, can we turn this into a worst case algorithm? And probably one could by doing some smart rebuilding in the background. We did not look into that direction, yeah. So the point is, we can show that this has now stretch log n to the fourth because the first thing had stretch log n to the third and then we did one more probabilistic tree embedding on top, losing another log n factor. And the running time is basically the update time for TD and for I and then building this tree um, and running the probabilistic tree embedding on it, which is just linear uh, m, polylog, m log n. So we get this running time. And then we need to amortize the rebuild operation uh, over square root m many operations. So altogether we end up with square root m times log n running time. Okay, so this was the first thing here that I claimed. 
the stretch with this update time. Now, if instead of actually here, instead of here recomputing this from scratch, if we instead keep a fully dynamic algorithm that stores P union I between any two ripples, so we recursively use our algorithm that we just built and plug it into here, what we get is something that increases the stretch by another log n factor, but improves the running time. Okay, so you can keep, because now this is no longer linear, this is just square root, okay? So you can keep on applying this recursively, and that's where you end up with this, n to the little o of one stretch, and update time n to the little o of one. Okay. And my feeling is that something better should be doable. Uh, this is nice and works, but something better should be doable. And there are applications. For example, you get faster dynamic approximate all pair shortest path algorithm out of this, or faster dynamic biot bulk network design algorithm. Okay, but we have a few minutes left, and I want to tell you about experimental evaluation of dynamic graph algorithms. So I want to step out of the theory bubble for a second and tell you something new here. Now you might wonder, why do I need to hear this? Okay, <laughs> here, is what, here is what shook me up, okay? So uh, dynamic delta plus one vertex coloring, where delta is the maximum degree. So you want to give a color to every vertex. You have delta plus one colors available. If two nodes are incident to each other, they need to have a different color. It turns out there were two algorithms where they're sort of competing. Um, one by uh, Batakaria, Grandori, Kulkarni, and you, and one by myself and Peng. Um, this is Pan Peng, not Richard Peng. And now the question was, which one would actually perform better in practice? Okay. So I had this very good uh, algorithms engineering PhD student, and I said, can't you implement this too? I want to know. Uh, my bet was that my algorithm would be better in practice. Our algorithm would be better in practice, okay? Which was true, by the way. But, <laughs> but this guy was a very good algorithms engineer. So he implemented this stuff, but you know, just for sanity check, he also implemented another algorithm, which was not at all a uh, constant time, okay? He may implement it this time, um, maintain a neighborhood color histogram for every vertex. So for every vertex, you know the color distribution of the neighbors. And then when you need to recolor a node because an edge was inserted between two nodes of the same color, pick a random color that is not used by any neighbor. And if you change your color, you need to tell all your neighbors they could cost time delta because they need to update their color histogram. So this is order delta time. But then you said, ah, maintaining data structures is always bad. Let's just not maintain the neighborhood color histogram. Let's just run this algorithm. When recoloring, just pick a random color and then look at all your neighbors. And if there are some neighbors that have the same color that you just chose, then you recolor them recursively. Now you can argue it's also some kind of O tilde delta running time. And then I said, no, let's look at the experiments. And so the experiments were such that this last one, the orange one, was best. Then was the red one, it's here. Then the green one, I was right with this one. And then the blue one. <laughs> Okay, so these algorithms that are not at all constant time blew us away. Okay, and we tried this. This was on random graphs. We tried it on other real world graphs. It was always the same. Uh, we could build graphs that were deliberately bad for the orange one. Then the, on such graphs, the orange one was then slightly worse than the blue one, but the red one was still better. Or we came up with an algorithm that was really bad for the red one, then the orange one was better. There was just no way that we could come up with a graph that would beat both of them. So what do I learn from this? Or why is this? Well, of course, updating these extra data structures, so these things here had lots of extra data structure, and this one also still has the color histogram, leads to additional work and low locality of memory access. You were jumping around in the data structure. Is it, why? So is, I can't see the y-axis. Is, is it the running time. Is it actual time? Yeah, yes. so I, I wonder if and this you, is 100 and this is 100 squared. Okay. If you measured it by uh, some yeah. notion of elementary operations so as to disregard cache performance, do you think you'd see uh, mm -hmm. substantively better difference? Yes, yes, yes. I would see, uh, so the question is if you would uh, count the number of elementary operations and not count cache and not have running time, but instead these elementary operations, so you disregard the cache effects. Yes, then I would see different results. 
because this is a local problem. Okay, that's what I'm saying down here. So a local problem where you can find your answer by just looking at your neighborhood. And if your catch is big enough, then getting your, if you look at one neighbor, it costs you just as much as looking at all your neighbors because you get the whole neighborhood into your cache or maybe into two cache lines, right? So basically looking at one, looking at the whole neighborhood just costs you roughly constant. And uh, that's what these algorithms here heavily exploit. And our RAIN model completely ignores that. So for us, it's super expensive to look at all the neighbors, right? It's delta. So what do I learn from this? First of all, I think it's very valuable to implement and experimentally evaluate dynamic graph algorithms. It's sort of is a sanity check for the work that we do. <laughs> and maybe, you know, what you're optimizing for is my, doesn't always make sense. And the other thing is there is, of course, a model. It's called the external memory model yeah, that takes cache effects into account. And there is actually very little on dynamic graph algorithms in the external memory model. I found only one paper here on incremental or decremental breadth first search. So that might be a valuable area to look into. Um, we, in our survey, actually, we talked a lot about what kind of uh, graph algorithms have been experimentally evaluated. We classified them into three types, the ones where the theoretically best algorithm has been evaluated, maybe modified, the ones where there are only heuristics implemented, and the ones where there's so far no only theory and no experimental evaluation yet. And now there are other advantages to doing uh, experimental evaluation. One is it's very easy to compare the performance in different classes of graphs, right? For example, sparse graphs or power law graphs and so on and so forth. Okay, something where in theory, you know, it takes off a lot of time to think about, does it perform better on this class of graphs? Here you just run it and see whether you get some improvement. It's also relatively easy to implement different types of updates, like weight changes or vertex updates. And finally, it's usually quite convincing for engineers in the industry uh, once you have an algorithm that's experimentally evaluated, and this is a way for us and our theory work to actually have impact on, real, on the real world. So that's my motivation when I look at this. Um, it's actually not easy, experimental work, especially good experimental work. One question is always, where do you get up-to-date data, relevant data? Um, people use either real-world graphs or synthetic gra generated data. What are the right experiments and measurements? That's also not always so clear. So for example, if you compare yourself uh, with a static algorithm, you might look at what is the break-even problem size, which is what is the problem size such that when the graph is this size or larger, the dynamic algorithm is actually faster than the static one. Usually in gra small graphs, static algorithms are much faster than dynamic ones. You might also look at the break-even insertion deletion percentage. So maybe the insertions are fast and the deletions are slow. And then you uh, might want to check how many insertions do I need that it's worth to use an uh, dynamic algorithm. Maybe I should just run the static one. Uh, in real world, updates are usually batched. And then the question might be, if the batches get too big, is it still worth to run a dynamic algorithm? If the batches are too big, a static might again be better. So look at the uh, speed up versus batch size. And then finally, uh, what is the right hardware to use? Nowadays, you have this multi-core CPUs, GPUs. Um, so when you implement these algorithms, you have to think about what do you use? And this also leads to the question, maybe we should be looking more at parallel or massively parallel dynamic graph algorithms. Um, so summary here is um, there are different advantages and challenges to theoretical work, but for us to have impact, uh, algorithms engineering is an important step. Okay, um, it's an important contributor and we should have high respect for doing, for people who do good work in this area. So my overall summary now, finally, I think dynamic algorithms are useful. I hope I convinced you of that. Uh, many upper bound results exist, but not so many have been experimentally evaluated. For lower bounds, there's some new exciting work in the cell prop model, and there's also work in average case model and for algorithms with prediction. Um, for upper bounds, I showed you one concrete problem, and the question is, of course, can you improve upon that? And other work or problems that I like are the gaps I mentioned before for all pair shortest path and uh, maximum cardinality matching. 
And um, what I also think we should more and more work on are dynamic algorithms with additional properties. I mentioned already external memory or parallel, but might also look at small space. And there, there might be useful lower bounds that we can get from the streaming literature already, what can be done here, or also uh, differentially private uh, dynamic graph algorithms. Thank you very much. Does this work? Yes. Here we go. So in my one venture into experimental stuff, I noticed that the, my adventure into experimental stuff, I noticed that for the very, very large graphs with billions of edges and stuff, the representation matters too, right? They're not given in how I would have expected them to be represented. Have you, is that an issue? Have you noticed that as an issue? And should we be dealing with particular representations. Yeah, there's no standard representation. That's that's correct. And um, so basically... There's no standard representation. So I had the impression from the person I was working with in some databases that there are some standard representations, but I wasn't aware of them. What, what, have, what have you seen in that respect? Well, so what we have been using is uh, this um, KHIP framework that came out of... Um, extensions of uh, C++, graph extensions for C++. Mm -hmm. So that was that was what we usually build upon. And that representation, but when you get graphs, they're often represented in some way and you have to first transform it them in the suitable representation for your algorithms. Yeah. So you can't transform it as you need it somehow? Like you have to transform the whole graph before you can work on it? It's in That's what we usually did, yeah. So usually also you just get a static graph and then what you have to do is turn this in some way into a dynamic graph. So the question is, for example, do you do sliding window or do you do edge flips, random edge flips? So what, what do you do? Yeah. Um, sometimes you get like Wikipedia graphs and you, you get different times uh, snapshots at, in time. And then you can say, okay, there must have happened a batch update in between. And, and then you put them in some random order or so. Thank you. I, I was thinking about the upper lower bounds in the very beginning of the talk, and I was wondering to what degree—it's not on. I was wondering to what degree are there like better cell probe upper bounds for some of these problems, and therefore the difference of like cell probe conditional lower bounds has to do with like the information theoretic complexity of the problem versus the computation. Ah, bound. yeah, I'm not aware of any work in cell probe upper bounds. Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you are interested in the number of shortest paths between every pair of nodes, is there still a notion of probabilistic tree embedding uh, that we can utilize, let's say, for the purpose of approximating the between the centrality of vertices? Wait, what is the question? Now you said at least three things, counting the number of shortest paths uh, and now between the centrality. Actually, yeah, so let's just focus on number of shortest paths. If you are interested in, uh, uh, in the number of shortest paths between every pair of nodes, is there still a notion of uh, probability tree embedding that we can use to approximate that? I'm not aware of a probability tree embedding that counts the number of shortest paths, no, no. And I mean, as I showed, if the shortest path is length five, it's going to be hard to maintain dynamically anyway. Exactly, of course. Um, yeah, that's the other weakness of these lower bounds. Very often it's only for the exact number and not for the uh, approximate number. Yeah. So many of these uh, conditional lower bounds only hold for the exact setting. So you just want to approximate the number of uh, shortest paths. Our lower bounds don't say anything. But I'm not aware of any probabilistic tree embedding that would do that. No. You mentioned uh, dynamic data structures are useful and you mentioned industry. Do you have any uh, war stories or uh, reports of uh, examples of these uh, data structures being used in practice? Just, just one or two examples to inspire us perhaps. <laughs> no, I know, but I haven't worked in industry for quite a while, so <laughs> no. And uh, I can just say in the early days of uh, these online traffic uh, uh, navigation systems, um, they didn't 
use uh, interesting dynamic data structures. But then there was this very good work by Goldberg et al on um, this graph, highway graphs or something they were called uh, that showed that could be updated efficiently. And at least in some variants for some companies, they were then implemented. But uh, initially, no, definitely not. But I haven't worked in the industry for a long time, so maybe I'm the wrong person to ask. <laughs> well, next week, we will have people from industry, and you should ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. And uh, regarding the... Um, the time constraints and the uh, all these uh, speed constraints of the algorithms. From this uh, work that you've been doing with the trees, uh, have you taken into consideration these like memory caches and these problems that the implementation of these uh, uh, codes, these algorithms actually, uh, on this in your uh, time constraints and your time predictions for these algorithms or not yet? So the question is, whether we have done basically external memory algorithms for, yeah. for all these problems, yeah. And no, I mean, the only external memory algorithms that I'm aware of are the ones that I mentioned here for insertions only and deletions only breads for search. Okay. And the, there's like some, uh, let's say, let's have venue for that, like for this exploration for like the part. Yes, if you publish external memory dynamic graph algorithms, you can publish that in the standard theory conferences because Everyone is aware that external memory algorithms are actually very tough. And uh, to get speed ups there is, is very interesting. And actually, maybe one should look at conditional lower bounds for them. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that might also be uh, that they all, uh, that, that might be the reason that there hasn't been much progress. I want to still encourage uh, people to think about them because um, let's not stick too much with this one model. This one model, yes, we can you know tune our favorite parameters, but if we want to have impact, you know, think about what what keeps us from having impact. And one of them is you know these kind of examples here, right, um, which show that our model is not perfect. So, but you know, I'm not claiming I'm the only one who knows how to fix things. But this and the parallel setting, um, I think, are very relevant in order to have more impact. Monica's given us our marching orders. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted the missionary talk. <laughs>